North America has one of the most extreme ranges of climate of anywhere on Earth. The hottest temperatures ever recorded on the continent were in Death Valley, California. The coldest ever was minus 81 Fahrenheit, recorded at Snag, Yukon in 1947. I'm on a mission to meet people who run to extremes. Ultra racing in the hottest and coldest spots in North America. I think my uh, race career is over. One hundred and thirty four degrees Fahrenheit. The record breaking temperature from nineteen thirteen is why I'm here in Death Valley National Park. This place is one of the one of the hottest places in the world, really. On any given day in the summer, this is probably the hottest place. Uh, there's a few others in the world that come close, but this place is extremely consistently hot, dry, and low. We're approaching two hundred and eighty two feet below sea level, and this heat can be fatal. Like many of Mother Nature's phenomena, a perfect mix of just the right elements is what creates the region's extreme heat. Death Valley is the lowest point in the United States and surrounded by mountain ranges up to 3,300 meters high. A lack of vegetation, an average rainfall of less than seven centimeters, and what you have is a huge convection oven. The sun beats down and is reflected off the valley floor, heating the air over and over. It's in this searing heat of the Death Valley summer that 84 athletes from 15 countries and across the United States will compete in Kiel's Badwater Ultra Marathon. They run 135 miles from Badwater, which is 282 feet below sea level, all the way up to Mount Whitney. Now that's five marathons run consecutively over the period of two or three days, depending how good you are. <laughs> Either these people are uber athletes or they're completely insane from the heat. The biggest misconception about this race is that these people doing it are a bunch of nut jobs. Chris Kostman is the race director in charge of this entire event. Uh, they're going to encounter an incredibly challenging course out there. The pavement itself will radiate about 200 degrees this afternoon. They're going to climb three mountain ranges. It's extremely dry, and uh, they're going to drink a lot of fluid to get from here to the finish line. Ultra racing is a fast-growing sport, with races held on every continent in the world, even Antarctica. But this 60-hour competition in Death Valley is considered one of the toughest on the planet. There's no prize money, runners that finish get a medal, and if they complete the course in under 48 hours, the coveted Badwater belt buckle. You know, I used to think that they were totally insane, but now that I've talked to a few of them, I think maybe they're not as crazy as I originally thought. These guys are passionate about what they do. People think I'm crazy, so you know what? It takes all kinds. I'm starting to like these guys. While the runners head up the Baking Highway, I take the opportunity to explore the incredible terrain here. This is Devil's Golf Course, and it's some of the most diabolical terrain that I have ever seen. This isn't even rock, it's salt. The old lake that used to exist here has completely evaporated, of course, from the intense heat here, leaving nothing but these amazing salt structures behind as the only testimony to the lake's original existence. At least the wind cools you off a little bit, but just a little bit. There are ghost towns like this peppered throughout the region, most of them former mining towns. Now this one, Rhyolite, had a population of 6,000 people back in 1907. Today, it's just me. Time to check back in on the race, as the leaders are now battling the hottest part of the day. Well, the cloud cover is now cleared off. 
it's gotten scorchingly hot here again. Huh, really hot. And the runners are starting to slow down. Okay, so this gives you an idea of how hot it is. 119 degrees, 48 Celsius. In this heat, your body is losing about a liter of water an hour, so keeping your fluids up is critical. One million people visit Death Valley each year, and every summer, park rangers like Charlie Callaghan rescue dozens of people lost or stuck without adequate water. It's very easy for folks to reach a point of no return, and that's why for us out here, it's real important to catch folks before they go into heat stroke, when they're just at the very beginning of, of heat stress and stuff, to be able to cool them down and get liquids in them and get them out of the heat before it's too late. Here at the very bottom of Death Valley, well below sea level, is a giant salt flat. And this is all that's left of the ancient lake that was here. It's all evaporated except for the salt. Anyone for a margarita? Definitely like being on another planet. It's pretty cool. You can see where all these individual pads of salt have been crashing into each other, and the edges get raised up the salt sort of chunks come together and crash when it's wet. Like me and those running Kiel's Badwater Ultra Marathon, many people come to extreme places to challenge themselves. But it's often only a short distance between extreme challenge and extremely dangerous. There's a pretty famous story around Death Valley of a hiker who tried to walk across the salt flats here, all the way to the mountains on the other side, over here. And he didn't bring enough water with him. This hiker was woefully unprepared. He wasn't carrying the 32 liters of water he would need to replace what his body was fast burning off in the extreme heat. Halfway into his endeavor, and the emulsion on his videotape was actually melting. The temperature inside his camcorder was over 143 Celsius. When the heat begins to affect you, some of the effects are, are similar to what happens in the cold and hypothermia, because you begin to lose your sense of reasoning. You've lost more moisture than what you can replace. Your body is beginning to shut down, and those who experience that extreme begin to go into shock from the heat, and they just no longer realize what's happening to them. After six days combing the salt flats, the search and rescue teams found the hiker, but it was too late. He's in this convection oven, laying on salt, wicking all the moisture out. So when they actually recovered the remains, it was basically mummified and the bones were rattling inside. You know, it was, the, all the moisture was gone. We've got a new high temperature for the day, 121 Fahrenheit which is 49 degrees Celsius. Holy crap. With the temperatures and risks so high, it must be pretty dangerous to have 84 athletes running here in the height of the summer. Every year people drop dead in Death Valley, but none of them have been competitors or support crews in the Keels Badwater Ultra Marathon, and we'd like to keep it that way. Unlike the hiker on the salt flats and others who die out here every year, these racers are well-trained, well-prepared, and well supported. But even with the best preparation, support, and protective clothing, runners can still get into trouble and end up here, in the care of one of the event's 10-member medical team. 87 if anybody asked me if this was a healthy endeavor, um, I'd have to say no, it isn't. It's extremely hard on your body, and people pay a price for it. I don't have the support crew or the stamina, but seeing these runners tough it out, I want to experience just a little of what they're going through. These guys are good.
bad water standards, today's race conditions are really good. There's overcast skies and a breeze, but still the temperature is over 110 degrees. I think my uh, race career is over. We'll leave it up to the experts to finish <laughs> this diabolical event. It's the end of day one, and only three of the 84 runners have scratched so far. The temperature tonight in Death Valley will cool to 34 degrees Celsius. Without the harsh glare of the sun, athletes now only have to battle exhaustion and sleep deprivation to make it until morning. Day two, and for some, the race is over. Valmir Nunez from Brazil is first to cross the finish line at 8.51 in the morning, but it's shaping up to be another extremely hot day. And with 36 hours left on the clock, most of the runners are still out on the course. Ow, I can't even put my knee on the ground. So here it is, off the scale. So that's the temperature in the sun. Many of the other runners will have to spend another day another night, and yet another day running across Death Valley. And you have to be here to experience this heat. Uh, I can go back and tell our friends about, especially this section right here, but you have to be out here to know it. It's, uh, it's just more than one could uh, think about. While this runner continues his trek, it's time for me to move on. From the extreme heat of the Death Valley summer to the extreme cold of the Yukon winter. Over 3,000 kilometers and 90 degrees Celsius separate North America's hottest spot, Death Valley, from its coldest, the Yukon. As I arrive in Canada's frozen north, the temperature has hovered around minus 50 for over two weeks. This fog is ice fog. And what's happening is it's so cold right now that any moisture in the air that comes up from the sewers, the car exhausts, the river, it just freezes and hangs there in the air. For those of you who don't believe that it's really this cold, here's a simple science experiment. Take minus 40 degree temperatures and a cup of boiling water. Instant snow. There are two extreme races taking place in this bone chilling climate. The Yukon Arctic Ultra Marathon and the Yukon Quest, a thousand mile dog sled race from Fairbanks, Alaska to Whitehorse Yukon. The quest is already underway, so I head to Dawson City, the halfway point and mandatory 36-hour rest stop to see how the mushers and their dog teams are coping with the cold. Oh, the first couple days was brutal. We started out, I think it was 50 below, and uh, my first camp out on Birch Creek, my thermometer on my sled was maxed out at 60. Now, I don't know how cold it was, but as cold as I've ever been. Three-time Quest champion Lance Mackey is the first of 22 mushers to arrive in Dawson. Seven teams have already quit the race, which is internationally renowned as the toughest dog sled race in the world. The Quest Trail follows a pre-Gold Rush trading route over four mountain ranges through incredibly remote wilderness in the depths of winter. Carrying everything they need on one sled, mushers must take care of themselves and their dogs for up to 10 days in the coldest temperatures on the continent. There's just no forgiveness at 40 below. The repercussions of your actions or your inattentiveness, uh, they become very quickly known to you. And you just, you have to think before you act all the time. You can't have any wasted motion. So if you, as you walk up the team on one side to go feed the dogs, you're walking down the team on the other side to collect their booties. Otherwise, you just find yourself out in the cold for a longer period of time, and that just becomes inefficient. And inefficiencies over a 1,000 miles tend to cost you hours or days or maybe even the race. After watching the dog teams arrive in Dawson, I'm keen to try mushing for myself. At Uncommon Journeys, there are 50 sled dogs eager to break trail even at minus 40. The snot's freezing on my nose. My eyelashes are starting to freeze. <laughs> Fun stuff. The dogs still love to run when it's cold, but some need to wear jackets to maintain their core temperature and booties to protect their feet from the abrasive snow and ice. So what's the basic principle? Well, George, the principle is real simple. You stand on this thing and they pull. What have I got myself into this time? 
some brief training in the three methods of braking, and we're off. transportation I've ever taken. Dawson City is chock full of wild stories and characters, but one story I just had to follow up on is the one about a man who lives in a cave. Across the river from Dawson, Bill Donaldson is spending his 12th winter as Caveman Bill. It's great, it's just, I think it's a great idea. Like, why not, right? Yeah, yeah. Why not? With a wood stove, computer, and plans for internet access this year, Bill's grown accustomed to the long Yukon winters. One thing I really like about the cold snaps is when, a, when the weather warms up, it just feels so much better. After you've been 40 and 50, 20 below, it's like, yoo-hoo! As you know, um, we have a problem with the weather forecast. Others also sharing Bill's wish for minus 20 temperatures are the organizers of the Yukon Arctic Ultra. It's predicted to be minus 50 um, in certain areas uh, where we are heading for uh, several days. 30 competitors have flown here from Europe, New Zealand, the United States, and all over Canada. But the deep freeze may force tomorrow's race to be rerouted or even delayed. In minus 50, things just start to not work anymore. And our worry, our concern is that we have athletes getting in trouble out there and that they cannot be evacuated because we simply don't have machinery that works. There's no one out here on the course to rescue you. I mean, it might be uh, an hour, it might be 10 hours before somebody could get to you, and that could be too late. This race seems to be cursed. word the snowmobiles are working they're running and they're breaking the trail right now for the runners in a few minutes the runners are going to grab their packs and start heading up the trail it turns out that with the temperatures we have today this is going to officially be the coldest marathon ever run including the ones at the north and south pole five four three two one and go There are, in fact, three races taking place here. 26 miles, 100 miles, and the longest, 320 miles. That could take up to eight days to complete. It's amazing how much time these racers spend alone. Once they break away from the pack, it's nothing but them and the Yukon River. Fresh snow on the trail is a tough slog. Some racers use snowshoes for better traction. Others make do with that. Either way, they each pull a 20 kilogram sled carrying their food, water, clothing, and equipment. It's hard. And we are at the beginning. There's a vast difference between what I'm wearing and what these athletes are wearing. They're generating a lot of body heat, and that body heat is keeping them warm, so they don't need as many layers. They don't want to be sweating, because if you sweat, that sweat will cool you down and then increase the risk of hypothermia. In Death Valley, runners faced dehydration and heat exhaustion. But in this race, the dangers for these athletes are frostbite and hypothermia. I think there's less, sir. Uh... Just margin for error here at minus 40 odd or whatever it is. There are any mistake you make is a real issue. That's my bits. In these temperatures, bare skin can develop frostbite within minutes. While I fight to stay warm, 
the athletes struggle to push on through the day and into the night. Watching them, both here and in Death Valley, you can't help but wonder how they keep going. Pushing your body to such extremes takes amazing reserves of willpower and psychological strength. Ultra racing veteran Diane Van Deren is an incredible example of this. She's tackling the full 320 miles and absolutely maintains her focus. You just gotta pace yourself and not get ahead of yourself. You got a long couple days here, so right now I'm just seeing about maintaining my energy, staying smooth, and just uh, staying in the moment, looking at this gorgeous view, and keeping my eyelids from freezing. At the 100 mile checkpoint, she's ready to offer her evaluation of the Yukon course. I've run the highest mountain, the longest, the strongest, the hottest. I mean, I've, I've done all the elements. There's no doubt this is the most brutal. You see the temperatures, 40 below, 50 below. You know, the numbers are numbers. They sound extreme, but when you're in it, I'm telling you, it's, it's a whole new, new element. The temperatures are just bone chilling. Only one athlete of seven completes the 26 mile race. Of the 13 entered in the 100 mile, seven scratch. And Van Deren herself is one of two athletes out of 11 who make it the full 320 miles. With the risks so high and no prize money as reward, why do these athletes run in these extreme conditions? They all share a search for, for their limits. They search an adventure that they can uh, you know, talk about and think about for their entire life. That's what they all have in common. Usually, in my travels around this angry planet, I'm in awe of spectacular natural phenomena. But with these trips, I'm left in awe of the indomitable human spirit. <laughs>